Uh, the last few uh, weeks, we've been going through a series called Why Church? And um, uh, last Sunday, Pastor Richard talked about the great commandment, the great compassion, and the great commission. There's a really funny quote that I read in his manuscript. Uh, the church is something like Noah's Ark. If it weren't for the storm outside, you couldn't stand the smell inside. The church is, a, is an assembly of those who know their need for God, who rejoice that their sins are forgiven because of Christ's death, and our eternity is secured through his resurrection. Last week, I was in, uh, Christina and I, and, and Dumi Sani, and Boo, uh, were in New York City to celebrate our oldest, Cesar Gailey's, college graduation. She graduated from the King's College with her bachelor's degree and uh, plans to go on to law school after taking a year off. And that reminds me that we will be honoring all of our graduates in worship services on June 12th. So if you know a high school graduate, a college graduate, a trade school graduate, a graduate school graduate, uh, you get the picture, right? If they're a member of your immediate family and you're sitting here, um, we want to honor them, or if you're aware of, a, of another member of our church who's graduating, um, we'd like to honor them. Uh, please email office at fumcbakersfield.org for that, okay? Um, <clears throat> let's see. I think that's all, those are all my announcement kind of things. Uh, let's, uh, let's pray once more. Lord, we just pray that you would speak to us today. We pray that you would have a free reign among us today to move as you see fit. We pray, Lord, for members of our congregation who um, are facing needs of various kinds, both physically, emotionally, uh, also financially. And Lord, we pray that your healing hand and your hand of provision might be upon all those in need today. We thank you, Lord, that you are King of kings and Lord of lords, and we pray that your spirit would illuminate us, that this would not just be me uh, yakking up here, but that this would be uh, your word to us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When we lived in Chicago and winter snows melted in springtime, I did a lot of walking. I lived about a mile and a quarter from the church that I served, and I got to walk down some tree-lined streets with Victorian-esque houses alternated with some houses designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. And for me, as the grandson of an architect, it was just like the perfect walk. And my walk began and ended on this really busy north-south corridor called Harlem Avenue. And about two blocks away from our little townhouse was the West Suburban Temple uh, Har Zion. And I loved uh, going past that place because I think, yeah, there we go. Because inscribed on the side of that building was uh, this scripture, uh, which, which is one of my favorite scriptures, Zechariah 4 6. It was a daily reminder to me that no matter whether everything was great or life was difficult, and I've had plenty of both of those kinds of days. The true source of strength and power is found in the Spirit of the Lord. This scripture is also in the front of your bulletin and here on the screen. Let's read it together. Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Now what or who is this uh, Spirit of the Lord? Or uh, who is the Holy Spirit? It's very important for us to understand that the Holy Spirit is not an impersonal force. He is God, equal with the Father and the Son. We see in the Trinity the same God with perfect equality and yet uh, playing different roles. I'm convinced that we won't fully understand the concept of the Trinity until we get to heaven, but we do see the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all taking part in creation, in the calling of God's people throughout history, in the establishment and carrying out of the old covenant with Israel. We see the uh, activity of the Holy Spirit more plainly 
in the life and teachings of Christ and in the establishment of the way of salvation for humanity, namely the death of Christ on the cross. And we see the Holy Spirit in full power at the resurrection of Christ and the establishment of the church on Pentecost, which we celebrate today. And our hearts resonate as the closing verses of Scripture are read. The Spirit and the bride say, come. Why, it is, why is it important that we understand that the Holy Spirit is personal God and not some impersonal force? Well, we have a lot of teaching today that seems to paint the Holy Spirit into some corner of uh, algorithms. It's taught that if we speak positively about things, we will see those positive things somehow materialize in our lives. If I stand up in the morning and I look at myself in the mirror and I say, I am talented. I am successful. I am disciplined. And my favorite as a victim of adult onset ADD, I am focused. <laughs> now, I, you understand that I'm not, I'm not trying to, to uh, give you grief if you're trying to call out things in yourself that you're working on developing, okay? But standing in front of a mirror and saying, I am handsome, or I am focused, is an exercise of futility if you're not going to do anything about it, right? But a lot of times we tend to, to uh, confuse this with the, the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not some aura that brings positive vibes and good thoughts into reality. He is active in every life. And as we set our minds on the Spirit, we have life and peace. Having your mind set on the Spirit is having a new mindset, a mind that shares the thoughts, purposes, and mission of the Spirit of God. As I was preparing for this message, I was praying about a way that we could remember together what it means to have our minds set on the Spirit. And uh, this kind of came to me as I was preparing. So you take the word set. For S, we have surrender. Everybody say that together. Surrender. For E, we have engage. engage. Oh, good. And for T, we have trust. Everyone? Trust. trust. All right, let's look at this as we consider this material today. I hope that you'll see that uh, no matter what or no matter what you're doing, where you are in your journey with God, you have an opportunity to set your mind on the Spirit. Now, I'm going to pause and backtrack and tell you that I had a funny experience in uh, New York City, um, and that is that uh, on our return flight home, we got there really early, and we didn't have a care in the world, and we got through security, and we still had an hour and a half, and uh, we just took our time getting to the plane. Got on the plane. Um, I checked my... Uh, I, I went to grab my backpack, which has my CPAP machine in it. Now, if you know somebody with sleep apnea, you know that they can't really function very well unless they have a, you know, their CPAP machine. I didn't have my backpack. I somehow it got left at TSA. I think they took it aside to inspect it, and then I just lost track of it, and I was busy with Dumisani, although it was not his fault, it's my fault, and um, got on the plane, and it wasn't there. So if I seem extraordinarily out of focus, I'm always a little out of focus, but if I seem extraordinarily out of focus to you, like I'm not finishing sentences or anything, there it is. Pray for me, okay? I really appreciate that. But let's look at set. Surrender and courage and trust. Surrender. I give up, God. I lay down the load I've been carrying and take up my cross to follow after you. I agree with you about who you are and who you say that I am. And I give myself to you. That's surrender. Abraham, when, he, uh, when told that he would father a son in his old age with his elderly wife, Sarah. Lot, when he negotiated with God about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Nebuchadnezzar, when he finally gave glory 
and honor to the God of heaven. Jonah in the belly of a great fish. The 12 disciples when they dropped everything, including their livelihood, to follow Christ. Saul on the road to Damascus and so many others had critical moments of surrender in their lives when they realized that the throne of their hearts belonged to God and God alone. Now, I wonder if the Spirit is calling you today to surrender to him, either for the first time or the second time or the 33rd time or the 84th time. You, you know what I mean, right? There's, there can never be too much surrendering in our lives to the Lord. There is, of course, an initial decision, an initial turnaround decision where I decide that I want to give my life to Christ And I come to know the grace of God that we know in Christ Jesus, our Lord. But then after that, every day, I have new opportunities to set my mind on the Spirit of God. And how I respond to those opportunities determine how I grow as a follower of Christ. And I believe that that is true for every one of us. But even in this, we cannot claim that we come to Christ on our own. Consider some of the ministry of the Spirit as it relates to surrendering. The Holy Spirit convicts all people of sin. The Holy Spirit draws sinners to Christ. When we come to Christ and believe that God raised him from the dead and confess him as Lord of our lives, the Holy Spirit seals us until the day of Christ. And related to this sealing is the process of holiness in the Christian journey, which, of course, all good Methodists know as saying, what is it? Sanctification. Oh, man, okay, that's good. You had me worried there for a minute. When we make our initial turnaround decision, the blood of Christ washes away our sin and the Spirit of God sanctifies us so that when God, the righteous judge, looks at our lives, he doesn't see our sin. He sees the blood of Christ covering our sin and he doesn't see our sinful nature. He sees the presence of the Holy Spirit there. But then what happens in our lives is that every day the Holy Spirit uh, gives us opportunities to work with him so that we can become more like Jesus Christ. Now, for some of us, including me, that takes longer than others, but I look forward to one day in heaven when I will be fully, completely sanctified like Christ, and I shall uh, see him as he is, and I shall be known too as I am known. This concept of sanctification leads us from surrender to engage. Consider the work of the Holy Spirit, which helps us to engage with him. He empowers us to bear the fruit of the Spirit. He gives us gifts to exercise. Now, I already mentioned our trip uh, a couple of times now to New York City. It was not all glitz and adulation. And uh, in addition to the glamour of graduation, we got to move Cesar Gelli from her college housing in New York City's financial district. Uh, She could look out her a bedroom window and see the Statue of Liberty to an apartment she's going to be sharing with friends in the middle of Brooklyn, where she can look out her bedroom window and see the next apartment bedroom window really clearly. (laughs) Um, At any rate, um, I got a, a, a great experience on Monday. I got to drive in New York City. I got to rent a U-Haul and drive in New York City. Now, I gotta tell you, I think the traffic on the 405 is a lot worse than anything that I experienced in New York City. Probably it could be because the public transportation system is so good, nobody bothers to drive unless they need it, uh, you know, they need their vehicle for their business. Or maybe it's because people just saw this dude coming in a U-Haul truck and they're like, I'm going to get out of the way because he obviously doesn't care. And I didn't. I took all the insurance I could, and I didn't care, baby. I was like, woo, you know, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, see if I care. And uh, I, I double parked. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. It was like, you know, I parked in front of a, uh, now, now, if, if a siren had sounded, I would have moved. But I parked in front of a fire hydrant, And, you know, because it was the only place I could park to unload the truck. So at any rate, in addition, though, to the to to the truck, 
I rented a four-wheel furniture dolly, which became invaluable as the day went on. At the new place, I used it to ferry uh, stacks of boxes to the curb, and then uh, fr from the curb into the vestibule of the apartment building, and then from the vestibule of the apartment building to the elevator, and then finally up to her apartment. And um, when I was finished, I just threw the dolly in the back of the truck like the U-Haul employee had done when I first checked out the truck in the morning. And I got in the truck and I rolled up to the first intersection and, in the, and I heard this, bam! It's like, what was that? So I jumped out and I, I opened up the, the, the truck and there was the dolly just kind of sitting up there by the cab and I was like, oh, whatever, there was a city bus coming up behind me. I was like, I gotta get out of here. So I closed the back of the truck without doing anything, sat back in the, and, and, and took off and I went to the next intersection, bam! Next intersection, bam! It took a few for it to dawn on me because this was the end of a very long day. It took a few of these intersections to dawn on me, oh yeah. The furniture dolly should be upside down so it can't roll in the back of the truck. So once again, I pulled up, parked in front of a fire hydrant, right in between this Lincoln limousine and a Jaguar. You know, it was great. You know, I was like, oh boy, if these people could see me, they'd be like, oh, dear Jesus. Anyway, I signed people up for heaven right then. But so I finally flipped, I finally flipped the, uh, the dolly over and I didn't have any trouble. But I thought, after I flipped the dolly over and there was peace and quiet in the back, I thought, you know, we can be a lot like that. <clears throat> God gives us gifts and graces, and we uh, are able to use them. And sometimes that creates a significant moment in our lives and even in the lives of other people. But then, you know, the, the time for that is over, and we just keep uh, rolling around in the back of the empty truck. And we roll and we crash because we're doing the same stuff that we did before and we're not responding to the changing environment. And sometimes we roll and we crash because of the movement of the truck and sometimes we roll and we crash just because we're fighting the new thing that God is trying to do in our lives or in our families, even in our church. And in that moment, that's when we must surrender Maybe we know deep down that uh, what we're doing, though perhaps good, or maybe even it's not good, maybe it's downright destructive, but we know that it's not what we could be doing if we ask God once again to guide us by his spirit. And then we must engage. Are we actively listening? And are we preparing ourselves for what's next? Are we reading and meditating on the scriptures? Are we active in, uh, and rooted in the community of the church in worship, in fellowship, and in service? Are we seeking out godly counsel from brothers and sisters in Christ? And are we spending time in prayer and listening for that still small voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts? And by the way, while we can offer support and prayer and sometimes when asked advice, we need to remember that we are not the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can bring recognition of need and lasting transformation in somebody's life. Now back to the empty truck. In a time of uncertainty and adversity, in a time of rolling and crashing, we must seize the opportunity to trust. There is a reason why we're in the empty truck. Sometimes that reason is known only to God. But wherever we find ourselves, we can trust in the goodness of God and the fact that this too can be used to reveal Christ in us. Why is it a good thing that the Holy Spirit is a personal God and not an impersonal force that increases when the vibes are positive and decreases when they are negative? Because we can't always be positive enough on our own. Don't get me wrong, being optimistic and staying positive are important as long as they don't get in the way of reality. But a lot of times we confuse positive energy with the Holy Spirit and we confuse good thoughts with prayer. Prayer is not speaking positively about a situation and thinking of good thoughts and hoping that the buildup of positive energy might affect some sort of change. That is not prayer. 
Please hear me on this, everybody. That's not prayer. Prayer is getting down on our knees and asking Almighty God to bring about something that is beyond anything that we could do or think. In the midnight hour, when we are in the valley of the shadow of death, in the dark night of the soul, in those moments we trust in the goodness of God and that the Holy Spirit who sealed us is with us still to bring about the fruition of his will in our lives. And in those moments when we don't know what to pray and all that we can do is cry out and say, God, help. In those moments, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us in words that we cannot express. And we see once again the reality of this great truth. It is not by might, nor by power, or anything else that you can do. But it is by my spirit. Say those three words with me. By my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. The Holy Spirit puts a new spirit within us that draws us to God. On a first name basis, we cry out, Abba, Dad, there is no fear, only embracing the unconditional love of the Father that we find through the Son. The Holy Spirit gives us assurance that we are the children of God. The mind set on the Spirit, surrendered to, engaging with, and trusting in the Spirit is life and peace. A life that is real and genuine, active and vigorous, devoted to God. A life blessed in this life and a life of infinitely more blessings in eternity. And not just a temporary feeling of peace based on only surface deep circumstances, but real settled peace that comes from deep inner fellowship with the Holy Spirit and loving fellowship with others who are likewise setting their minds on the Spirit. These become ours in abundance as we set our minds on the Spirit. The worship team is going to come up and lead us, and as they come up, let's read, uh, let's say Romans 8, 6 together. The mind, go ahead, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. I'd like to close with a prayer of Augustine. Breathe in me, O Holy Spirit, that my thoughts may all be holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that my work too may be holy. Draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I love but what is holy. Strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. Guard me then, O Holy Spirit, that I always may be holy. Amen.